Rescue of Innocence, by Mary Lovelace. Inspired by the Stargate episode A Hundred Days, 3.17, where Jack is stranded on the friendly planet, Edora, after wayward asteroids known as Fire Rain hit and buried the Stargate. In this story, the Stargate is beyond salvageable and Jack is not rescued by Teal'c, as per the original episode. The village is also larger and more populated than depicted in the episode. Rescue of Innocence Forward Living with Lyra and her young teenage son, Garen, Jack had started to settle into village life, albeit somewhat reluctantly. He'd quickly become a trusted figure among the villagers, respected for his disciplined military background, but admired more for his willingness to participate and support the self-sufficient community in any way he could. However, when he suspects abuse is happening to Garen, he finds himself torn between following the rules or taking action. Rescue of Innocence Chapter 1 It had been over a month since the Stargate was lost, struck by the fire rain. For the first two weeks, Jack had continuously searched the area, digging holes from dawn till dusk in the hope of finding the ancient device beneath the rubble. After that, the season dictated all able hands worked in the fields. There was a very tight window of time to ensure sufficient crops were planted, so the village could survive the expected extra-long winter that historically came every third year. Jack understood the importance of the planting, it really was a matter of life and death to these good folks, and he was more than willing to do whatever he could to help. Each day he volunteered his labor in the fields, but was back at the gate site again each evening, continuing with his search. Garen, Lyra's son, had taken it upon himself to help Jack in his search for the Stargate and every evening, despite being exhausted from working the fields, the kind-hearted youth would be loyally back at Jack's side with a shovel in his hands. Although Jack did appreciate the help, he'd argued with Garen and even Lyra, his mother, on countless occasions that he didn't need to help, that this wasn't Garen's problem or his responsibility. Each time, however, he was met with a quiet, but stubborn insistence from both of them. It had been another long day of planting crops. The villagers had stopped for the evening and Jack, as usual, had resumed his search for the Stargate, the ancient device that would be his ticket home and, as a plus, could help solve any winter shortage issues for the village. Garen appeared at the brow of the dig site carrying a shovel and a small bundle. You missed evening meal again, he called, negotiating his way down into the large rocky crater. I brought you some. Wasn't hungry, replied Jack, chipping away at the stony ground with his shovel. You gotta be, you've worked all day in the fields, Garen gently protested. I'll be fine, Figured I got a couple of hours of good light left. Garen stepped closer. Please, Jack, you need to eat something, he quietly implored, unwrapping the cloth bundle and offering what resembled a piece of quiche. I put some of that preserve on it for you, you know, the one you said you really liked. Jack paused, looking at the gentle youth with a grateful expression, but Garen could see the colonel's thoughts were elsewhere. Thanks, I'll have it later, just put it over there for now, he mumbled pointing to the big flat-topped boulder he'd been using as a table. Jack went back to digging, failing to notice the unusual stress in Garen's voice. The timid youth stood there watching him, fidgeting, wringing his hands nervously, clearly something was bothering him. Eventually, he plucked up the courage and spoke. I'm sorry. Garen spoke, almost in a whisper, his voice clearly nervous, trembling slightly. Jack paused, still looking at the ground. For what? You can't go home. It's my fault. He fretted. Jack started to dig again. No, it's not, he mumbled. In his tired and distracted state of mind, Jack had still failed to register how upset Garen was becoming. The conscientious boy had been in a perpetual state of deep guilt and emotional stress since a deadly meteorite storm, known by Adorans as Fire Rain, hit the ground a month ago and buried the Stargate. During the storm, instead of retreating through the ancient ring to safety, as planned, with the other villagers in SG-1, Garen had run away with his girlfriend, Natha, to hide in caves not far from the village. Jack chose to stay behind and help Lyra look for him, and it was during their search that the Stargate was struck by an asteroid, stranding him on the planet light years from home.
Despite Garen's lousy decision-making that day, little was said to him about it. It seemed no one was blaming him for what he had done, but for the past month he had been quietly going insane with the emotional weight of guilt he felt about causing Jack to be stranded there. To make matters worse, he had no idea what the colonel felt about his errant actions that had cost Jack so dearly. He'd only ever seen the man act mildly and composed since the incident, and in Garen's mind, it didn't make sense. He believed Jack should, at the very least be angry with him, even hate him for what he had done, yet O'Neill had remained as affable as always, never once showing any kind of anger, dislike or irritation toward him. Following SG-1's arrival, Garen had quickly grown to idolize Jack, looking up to the ex-retired colonel as a role model. He even began emulating some of Jack's mannerisms and adopted words he used, like cool. After the fire rain destroyed the Stargate and O'Neill ended up living in Lyra and Garen's home, the youth was quick to adopt him as a full-time surrogate father figure. As the weeks progressed, a caring relationship grew and evolved between them, as Jack became a stable constant in both Lyra and Garen's everyday lives. Jack's attraction to Lyra was growing stronger every day, as was hers, to him. He adored everything about her, her gorgeous natural looks, her tenacity, that she was strong-minded yet so gentle and compassionate. He loved her pragmatic approach to everything. If he had to spend the rest of his life on Adora, then Lyra was the one who'd enable him to accept that destiny. With her, in his life, his exile would be more than bearable. The colonel had also developed great fondness for Garen. The boy was like Lyra in many ways, but Jack was most struck by his very noticeable gentleness. Garen seemed to approach everything with such naivety and quiet benevolence, it had nurtured some strong emotions within O'Neill, the kind of protective fatherly instincts he'd only ever previously felt for his late son. The kid was clearly not a fighter, Jack had figured, quite the opposite. He seemed to be fearful of so many things, often irrationally so. The colonel had often pondered how Garen might fare living back home on Earth, especially going to an American school. Not well, he always concluded. Despite their growing closeness since the fire rain, Garen had been constantly feeling a sense of uncertainty and ambiguity with Jack. The sense of not knowing how Jack truly felt about him being responsible for his stranding was constantly there in the back of his mind, nagging and tormenting him. It was a horrible feeling that felt like a perpetual dark cloud hanging over what was otherwise a very agreeable and wholesome relationship. After four weeks of not talking about it, Jack's silence on the matter had become so deafening, Garen was starting to feel he would lose his mind if he didn't at least try to talk to him about it. He needed something, anything, that would let him know, once and for all, exactly where he stood with the man, regarding his irresponsible actions, even if that did mean learning Jack was monumentally pissed at him. The fretful youth continued wringing his hands as he watched the ex-retired soldier digging his shovel into the rubbly ground. He was waiting for the right moment to start speaking, waiting for some sort of cue, but he quickly realized that the perfect moment was unlikely to ever materialize. In the end, he finally found his courage and spoke up. I understand if you're angry with me, Jack. Garen spoke softly, his voice trembling nervously. Jack suddenly stopped digging and looked up at him, seeming puzzled by the youth's words. What? He gasped. Why would you say that? Because of what I did during the fire rain. Garen, I'm not angry with you, Jack stressed. But, you have to be, Garen Mule would in protest. I'm responsible for ruining your life, and I don't understand why you haven't got mad at me. As he spoke, Garen was becoming more visually agitated and upset. Jack, now more alert, finally registered how distraught Garen was becoming as the stored-up guilt that had been driving him crazy for the past month began to surface and overwhelm him. I really am so sorry, Jack, he pleaded, I had no idea any of this would happen. Is this why you've insisted on helping me every day? asked Jack, calmly. The youth reluctantly nodded. I'll do anything to make things right again, but this is all I can think of, he sniffed. Jack began to feel a pang of guilt as he realized his lack of communication on the subject was what had driven Garen to this point of obvious distress. 
The fretful youth was struggling to maintain his composure as tears began welling up in his eyes. Garen, for goodness sake, sighed Jack as he quickly set down his shovel and stepped closer. He reached out his arms to comfort the distraught youth, but on seeing Jack's sudden approach, Garen instantly hunched up his shoulders and snapped his arms up to protect himself, as if about to be assaulted. Whoa! O'Neill gasped, shocked by the purely instinctive reaction. He quickly pulled the cowering youth into a reassuring hug. As soon as Garen realized he was in no danger, he eagerly reciprocated, tightly embracing the colonel back. I'm not angry with you, Jack reassured him for the second time, patting his back. Jesus, did you think I was going to hit you just then? Garen didn't know how to answer. He just felt relieved and comforted by the colonel's response. O'Neill stepped back a little and gripped the fretting youth by the shoulders. Garen, listen to me, he gently urged, looking directly into the boy's damp eyes. Seriously, I mean it, you are not responsible for my situation. Nobody could have predicted this, this is not your fault. I don't blame you for what has happened, I never have and I never will, so stop worrying about it, okay? But I don't understand. It's directly my fault. The ancient ring was lost after you stayed behind to help mother search for me, Garen insisted. My actions stopped you from going back to your home, and now the ancient ring is gone. You have every right to blame me, to get angry with me, and I still don't understand why you haven't. Why haven't you got mad and shouted at me, or hit me, he sniffed. I'm not going to hit you, Jack snapped back, looking shocked at the suggestion. Seriously? Is that what you think has to happen here? It's your right, the boy whispered nervously, looking down at the ground. The hell it is, growled Jack. Who taught you that nonsense? It just is, replied Garen. Jack was speechless. Before he knew what else to say, he'd pulled the fretting boy back into another firm hug. My God, Garen, he gasped in a whisper. What kind of a monster do you think I am? I could never do something like that to you. End of Chapter 1 Rescue of Innocence Chapter 2 That night, O'Neill couldn't sleep, his earlier interaction with Garen running over and over in his mind. He couldn't help feeling something was very wrong. After a long discussion, he'd finally managed to reassure the guilt-ridden boy that he wasn't to blame for his stranded situation but something else wasn't sitting right in Jack's mind. It was the way Garen had instantly hunched up to protect himself when he'd reached out to comfort the youngster. Jack knew a fear-conditioned response when he saw one. He'd regularly witnessed similar behavior whilst dealing with victims of Goal depression, and he'd quickly realized there was only one way Garen could have acquired that kind of fear conditioning, through sustained, repeated exposure to violence. Breakfast was very early, before dawn, just as it had been for the past couple of weeks while the intensive crop planting effort was carried out by the whole village. After breakfast as first light began to filter across the land, Garen and Jack began getting ready to leave for the fields. Lyra would join them a little later on after carrying out a number of tasks, including preparing some food for one of the elderly villagers who needed assistance each day. Garen hugged his mother goodbye and joined Jack at the front door, and they set off together. As soon as they were a short distance from the house and away from Lyra's ability to hear them, Jack put his arm out and stopped the youth walking. Garen, I need to ask you something, it's important. Sure Jack, what's up? I want you to be completely honest with me, okay? The youth nodded. Of course. Garen, what's going on? Is someone threatening you? Or hurting you? Garen momentarily looked shocked at the question, even a little terrified, as if some dark secret he was desperately hiding had just been discovered. The now visibly nervous youth answered as calmly as he could, No, Jack, everything's fine. Jack could clearly hear the fear in his voice and see straight through the lie. Garen, you know I care about you, right? Garen nodded, unsure how to respond verbally. You know that you can tell me anything, okay? Garen silently nodded again. If you're in some kind of trouble, I can protect you, but I need to know what I'm protecting you from. 
No, really, everything's fine, Jack, honest. Garen's answer was forced and urgent as if trying to end the conversation as quickly as possible. He didn't even inquire why Jack had asked such a question in the first place. Jack had seen all he needed to. Just from Garen's body language alone he realized something was most definitely happening and Garen was far too intimidated by it to talk. He was so clammed up and afraid, there was no way he was going to say anything. Something or most likely, someone, clearly had huge control over him. O'Neill nodded and sighed, it's okay, Garen, I understand. Just remember I'm here for you, okay? Even if you're facing something really frightening, you don't have to face it alone, okay? Not while I'm here. I've got your back and I want to help. Garen looked encouraged by his words. He nodded, and Jack could see a momentary look in his eyes, suggesting he might say something. But the words never came. Thanks, Jack, was the subdued reply. Jack squeezed the youth's shoulder reassuringly. If you change your mind, I'm here for you, okay? I really mean that, Garen, just come and talk to me. Even if you don't want your mom to know, that's okay. You can just tell me. We'll figure it out, but you need to let me know what's going on. Again, Garen looked like he might say something, but whatever threat he had hanging over him was stronger than his courage that day. I told you, everything's fine, he replied quietly, forcing a false smile. Jack gave his shoulder another squeeze and gently nodded. He knew something very oppressive was clearly going on in Garen's life, but he wasn't going to get any answers out of him. I've left something at the house, why don't you go on ahead without me, I'll catch up with you shortly suggested Jack. Garen nodded, okay, Jack, see you out on the field. Jack headed back and re-entered the house. Lyra was just packing a few things into a hand basket, preparing to visit her elderly neighbor. He stepped in and helped her with the packing. Lyra, can I ask you something? Of course, she replied. It may be a little sensitive. I'm sure you've realized by now, Jack, we are a very open people. You should not fear to speak whatever is on your mind. He nodded, appreciating her frankness. What's the deal with Garen? She looked at him, her expression requesting a little more context. He's afraid of everything. What's going on? Lyra looked into his eyes and sighed. She didn't even seem surprised by his questioning words. Garen is anxious about a lot of things these days, she replied, he was always such a relaxed and happy child took everything in his stride with not a care in the world, but after my husband died and Garen lost his father, well, that's when his whole world turned upside down. It changed him. He hasn't been the same since. He's got so serious about things, especially lately, even before the fire rain hit the ground. He often chooses to stay home now when the village gathers socially, something he'd never dreamed of doing before. He stopped spending time with his friends, in fact, he spent more time with you this past month than he has with anyone else. Jack nodded gently as she spoke. You're the only one who's been able to motivate him lately, you seem to have helped bring him back to his old self a little bit, and for that, I am so grateful. Yeah, about that. Jack shifted uncomfortably, almost hesitant to tell her. You know he's been helping me search for the Stargate from a sense of guilt? I know. She replied matter-of-factly, but I also know you've gone out of your way not to lay any blame on him for your getting stranded here, even though we both know what happened. You are a very forgiving and kind man, Colonel Jack O'Neill. I consider it a great blessing you are in our lives at this time. She stepped forward and embraced him. Your being here has been healing for all of us, especially for Garen, it's why I've encouraged him to continue helping you. And he's not just helping you out of a sense of guilt or responsibility. He values and enjoys your company very much, just as I do. Jack had grown accustomed to Lyra hugging him. He enjoyed and adored her company too. Their relationship was clearly starting to blossom. Jack was cautiously allowing his feelings for her to develop a little more each day as the reality of his situation became more cemented. They stood holding and hugging each other for a while before Lyra eventually gave a sigh, suggesting they should probably get going. A few minutes later, they were strolling slowly along the dirt track outside the house, 
heading toward the split in the path that would send them in different directions, Jack to the rich farmlands and Lyra into the center of the village. Thank you for caring about Garen, she said. It's not difficult. He's a nice kid, Jack replied. It just bothers me that he seems so anxious all the time. His father's death hit him hard, replied Lyra, but time will bring him healing. Just as I did, he will choose to move on, hopefully soon. Jack nodded, feeling what Lyra had told him was genuinely her truth, what she wholeheartedly believed. There was no deception in her words, no body language to even hint at any kind of dishonesty or that she was hiding something, but he wasn't convinced in any way that Garen's anxious behavior was a result of grief. How did he get along with your late husband? Jack asked. Garen had a wonderful relationship with his father, they were very close, she replied, I'm sure it's why he's hurting so much now. Jack nodded, hesitating for a moment, knowing his next question was very contentious. Lyra, this may seem like an inappropriate question, but I need to ask. Did your husband ever discipline him? Lyra stopped walking, looking a little taken aback at Jack's words. Jack stopped beside her. If what I think you're asking me is, did my husband ever beat Garen? Then, absolutely not she implored in a gasped whisper. He was a kind and gentle man. He loved Garen dearly, just as I do. He could never have done such a thing. He barely ever raised his voice to him, let alone a hand or worse. She looked straight into Jack's eyes, and, no, I could never do such a thing either. It is not how we raise our young, nor would that kind of approach ever be tolerated here. Jack shifted uncomfortably. Sorry to ask. Colonel Jack O'Neill, you seem to be the kind of man who would never ask such a question, not unless you felt you had very good reason to, she said sternly, pondering further on what he'd just asked. I think you believe there is more behind Garen's behavior than just grieving, am I right? Jack nodded slightly, impressed by her deductive reasoning. I don't know anything for certain, all I can tell you is this, I've been military a long time and I've seen a lot of things. You quickly learn how people can behave, especially when fear has been an influence. What are you saying, Jack? asked Lyra in a suddenly more concerned tone. Jack thought carefully about his answer. I don't know exactly, he eventually replied, but there's something about his behavior that's giving me cause for concern. So you do think something other than grief is making him behave anxiously? Not something, I'm thinking more like some, one replied Jack. Look, Lyra, can you think of anyone who might be in a position to exert control over him, someone who might bully or mistreat him? Lyra looked uncertainly at him, then she turned her head away, seeming hesitant to answer. This is a small village, Jack, she gasped, it's not the done thing to go pointing fingers at people, especially with that kind of accusation, not without proof or evidence. So, that's not a no, then, Jack pointed out. We're a tight-knit and very trusting community here, we all look out for each other, after all, we rely on each other for our very survival. Everyone knows everyone else's business, there's very little anonymity here. If someone was harming Garen I would quickly get to know about it. Jack sighed, a little unsettled by Lyra's naivety and willingness to trust everyone so openly. You'd only know about it if it was witnessed. But you know as well as I do, in any group, there'll always be folks who don't want to play by the rules, those who'll want to sneak around and do things their own way. Lyra nodded, I suppose that's true, but Jack, if Garen were being harmed or threatened, he would tell me, he's a bright boy, he wouldn't hide something like that. Lyra, where I come from, it doesn't always work like that, replied Jack. Wherever there are humans living together, there will always be exploiters and bullies, I know how they think and operate. Their biggest fear is exposure, they'll take great steps to hide their activities and avoid being discovered. They can use fear to manipulate their victims into silence and make them feel helpless. Yeah, Garen's a bright kid, Lyra, but he's just not equipped to handle something like that. If he has someone controlling him, a threat hanging over him, particularly in his current state of mind, I don't think he's going to be speaking up about it anytime soon. The worried look on Lyra's face was enough to tell Jack he'd got her on side. Look, don't worry, 
I would never just wade in and start stirring things up, I can be very discreet. I'm trained in covert investigations, we do them all the time back home, it's part of our MO. I'll just look around, see if there is any evidence to be found, suggested Jack. Nobody will know or suspect what I'm doing. But I do need names, people I can keep an eye on, observe their behavior, see if anything seems suspect. Lyra began slowly nodding her head, finally convinced Jack's suggestion was the right approach. All right, I do want to make certain my son is safe. As do I, he assured. But I don't know how this is going to work, Jack, she added. I can't stress to you strongly enough, if you do see or discover something, as an outsider you won't be able to intervene alone. This has to be something the villagers deal with. Although you are very welcome here and I trust you completely, the value of your word will still always be considered that of an outsider. If you make any accusations without undeniable proof, it will likely be rejected and could jeopardize the harmony of the village as well as your future here. Jack nodded, I understand the rules and don't worry, I have an idea to address that, you just have to trust me. Lyra nodded, I do, she replied, and there's only one name you need to worry about around here, Henrik. The big angry farmer guy who tells everyone where to work in the fields? Lyra nodded. Well, I didn't want to say anything, but I really don't like that guy very much. Never had a good vibe from him. The man is a bully, added Lyra. Very arrogant and often aggressive, but he's been tolerated in the village because of his farming knowledge and skills. We started getting considerably larger crop yields when he began to organize the farming effort, so he's been given a lot more latitude than most would get, especially for his misdeeds. Jack raised an eyebrow on hearing her words. He asked if she could elaborate. Let's just say Henrik has a reputation for forcing his unwanted assertions onto others. At one time, he set his sights on me. She replied hesitantly, even though I was a married mother. He came to the house one evening when my husband was away. And he. She paused, struggling to piece together a description that would not trigger the still painful memories she had buried deep inside her conscience. Jack reached out and gently touched her forearm. It's okay. You don't need to say it. He whispered compassionately. I think I get the idea. I'm so sorry, Lyra. She nodded, grateful for his intervention. It was violent. So twisted. He is a sick man, Jack. His mind is not right. He seemed to thrive on seeing fear. She spoke softly. That was six years ago, I'm mostly over it now, but Garen still gets nightmares about it. Jack could feel his loathing for this character rapidly increase as he listened to Lyra's words. When the rest of the village found out, there were even more accusations made against him from others including from one of the older children, a boy who was about the same age as Garen is now. Henrik had been brutally beating him in secret. Jack felt sickened by what she had told him. He sounds like the worst kind of scumbag. Back on Earth, we call them sociopaths. Either way, he's clearly dangerous. You have families all over the village. How the hell is he still living here, Lyra? Asked Jack in disbelief. We wanted to banish him, she replied, but the truth is, we desperately needed his skills. The long winter was due that year and we knew we had a much better hope of surviving it with his extensive farming knowledge, so I ended up pleading on his behalf for him to stay. I certainly didn't want to, but I didn't want the village to starve either. What a nightmare. That couldn't have been easy, whispered Jack. It wasn't. But it was necessary, it was the only practical choice at that time. We forced Henrik to move from his dwelling in the village to the farmhouse on the outskirts near the barn where he would be away from the main village center. He's lived there ever since. That year, Henrik made an extra effort to prove his worth to us, and we had one of our best ever yields that harvest. The long winter came and went, we not only survived it, we flourished. Since then, Henrik's deeds have been mostly pushed to the back of people's minds, and he has continued to enjoy a certain immunity that any regular villager just wouldn't have had from such behavior. Jack nodded, listening as they slowly strolled along the track. I'm really glad you all survived the winter, Lyra, he whispered, but the circumstances suck. It's like he's holding you all to ransom. 
She nodded, we realize that too, but we have since taken steps to ensure this is no longer the case. Jack inquired what they did. That spring, Hainan, secretly went and stayed in one of the other villages we learned had also flourished during the long winter. There, he spent the entire growing season learning all the necessary farming skills and techniques we needed to create the kinds of yields that could sustain us through any future long-term winters. I suspect Hainan's knowledge on the subject is now greater than Henrik's and Hainan has been continuing to pass this knowledge down to many others in the village to ensure we are never held to ransom like that again. Henrik knows nothing about it, he thought Hainan was visiting a sick relative all the time he was away. Jack gently punched the air at his side. Yes. Good for you. See, this is what I'm talking about. That's why I love this place. Lyra smiled slightly at Jack's impromptu display of enthusiasm. So I'm guessing that Ratbag's days in this village are numbered, he's walking a fine line and he doesn't even know about it? Lyra nodded. We've all tolerated his abusive behavior for long enough, it's only a matter of time now, although I think he may suspect something has changed. Lately, he seems to have become less arrogant, like he's being more careful to not give us reason to send him away. Jack, sighed. Yeah figures, he replied, but I know the type. Guys like that, have a certain M.O., hardwired into their brains, he added. They're not stupid, they learn how to hide it well, but it's always they're lurking in the background just waiting to strike again when they think no one's watching. I promise you this Lyra, if I find Henrik has been harming Garen, I'm going to make damn sure he gets what he deserves. Remember, Jack, this is still all pure speculation. It's possible Henrik could be completely innocent in this. Jack nodded, I know. And believe me, I want to be wrong about my suspicions regarding Garen, I really do. But I also want to be certain either way. End of Chapter 2 Rescue of Innocence Chapter 3 for the next few days, village life continued as normal. Jack, Garen, Lyra and the rest of the villagers worked diligently in the fields, planting extra crops to keep everyone fed during the anticipated extra-long winter. Jack had chosen to temporarily give up his search for the Stargate while the intensive planting took place, and to give him time to covertly investigate his strong suspicions that someone may have been abusing Garen. Each day he had been repeatedly cautioned by Lyra not to take matters into his own hands and she wasn't afraid to tell him again and again, stressing that no matter what he found, his word as an outsider would not be taken over that of a villager, not without undeniable proof. She made it clear she didn't want to lose him, constantly stressing and driving home her point that if he acted on impulse, without proof, he could jeopardize his future in the village and their future together. Each time, Jack continued to reassure Lyra, promising he would remain faithful to her concerns and that his entire intention was not to take any action himself, but rather provide the villagers with any necessary proof they needed to take action for themselves. It was early evening. Garen had supposedly gone to spend time with Natha, as he often did, but when the evening meal was ready and he hadn't returned, Jack went to find him. The colonel was fairly sure they would be up on the small knoll overlooking the village, a place where Garen had mentioned to him how he and Nathia loved to spend their evenings together sat under the large tree there. The path skirted the edge of the village farmland, running past the remote farmhouse and its large barn before leading on to more open farmland and eventually the knoll hill. As the colonel neared the barn, he heard a loud voice coming from inside. It was Henrik's and he sounded angry. Jack silently ducked into the open side entrance and crept around toward the back of the barn from where the voice was emanating. In the light of several hung lanterns, Jack could see Garen standing there looking very nervous, anxiously wringing his hands in front of him. Henrik stood looming over him. They were alone, the only people out there, or so Henrik thought. Weakness. It disgusts me. Your father was a pitiful man, a pathetic weakling, just like you. It's no surprise you turned out just like him, the girlish ways you behave around here, no strength, no manliness, always skulking around the place, afraid of everything, it's pathetic. No wonder your old man died before his time. Henrik was snarling these words at the anxious youth. He wasn't strong enough, too weak to live. I gave him plenty of beatings you know, I bet he didn't tell you about those, did he boy? 
Garen stood there looking massively intimidated and afraid. The hatred and fear he had for this large overbearing man was clear in his eyes. Don't look at me like that, boy, I was doing your old man a favor, trying to toughen him up. Maybe if he was tougher, he could have prevented me from enjoying your mother that day. Henrik laughed out loudly at his own twisted words. It was all the confirmation the colonel needed to realize Lyra's suspicions were absolutely correct. Now, he just needed to be smart in doing something about it. Jack continued to silently observe. The more he saw and heard, the more angry he got. He wanted, badly, to run over and beat Henrik into the ground, but he knew he couldn't, at least not yet, not if he was to put a permanent end to this obvious and awful abuse. He could see Garen was getting more and more agitated. The growing level of fear in his eyes suggested he knew what was coming. Henrik continued tormenting the boy with his caustic, obnoxious words and threatening posture. He seemed to enjoy making him flinch and cower by threatening to hit him, and Jack instantly realized those were the same flinch reactions he saw in Garen that first alerted him to the abuse. Henrik continued his taunting. Your mother, she wanted me. She wanted it with a real man instead of that pathetic weakling she called a husband. So I just gave her what she was begging for anyway. That's not true, squealed Garen, suddenly finding courage from within, fueled by the obvious anger in his voice and in his facial expression. You calling me a liar, boy? It's true, growled Henrik. When they wanted to banish me, she was the one who came to my defense and begged the others to let me stay. You see, boy, she wanted me to stay, and now that your old man is gone, she's gonna be mine again, real soon. I'm gonna be your new daddy. He laughed out. On hearing the cruel words, something inside Garen snapped. It was more panic than courage, but he tried to run. Henrik instantly grabbed him by the throat and Garen began lashing out, punching, kicking, unleashing every ounce of strength he had in a make-or-break attempt to get away from there and end his ordeal. The large beastly man just laughed out, easily subduing the boy, smacking him hard on the side of the head before punching him so hard in the stomach, it lifted him off the ground. Garen yelped in pain, suddenly falling to his knees clutching his stomach, writhing around on the straw-covered ground in obvious pain. As he watched the abusive man unleash his sadistic sickness on the innocent boy, Jack could feel his heart thumping, adrenaline surging in his veins. Every instinct, every fiber of his being was screaming for him to jump out and rescue Garen, to put an end to this right now, and put Henrik on the ground, or perhaps, even in it. But he knew he couldn't, not yet, not if he was to permanently bring an end to this. Lyra had stressed to him time and time again that his word of witness would not be enough to turn the village against Henrik or to get him banished. Jack realized without the villagers behind him, Henrik could remain free to go on abusing Garen and others, potentially long into the future. He knew he couldn't let that happen. Even though it went against every instinct he had, Jack had to keep his anger muted and under control. He knew his hands were tied for the moment, he couldn't intervene yet, at least not without killing Henrik outright, something he had already started to contemplate as a plan B to his original plan, which was already well underway, he just needed a little more time to complete it. The urge to intervene was so strong, resisting it was starting to make Jack feel nauseous. He could feel his gut churning and his own heartbeat in his throat as he watched Garen, the gentle, kind-hearted youth he had grown to care enormously for, terrified and suffering at the hands of this sick monster. Not acting, went against everything he had ever believed, and Jack, wondered if he would be capable of resisting the urge to intervene any longer. He tried desperately to rationalize everything in his mind, to stop himself from just leaping out and ending Henrik there and then. But the thought of bringing further violence, or even ending a human life right in front of such innocent eyes was unthinkable to him and keeping him from taking that path. What also stopped him was the look in Garen's eyes. He could tell the boy been enduring this same abuse regularly, and most likely for a long time. Despite the obvious fear in his eyes, there accompanied it a look of resignation and familiarity, as if he had started to become acclimated to it. When the thought entered Jack's mind that this abuse could have been as routine to Garen, as Saturday night bowling was to himself, Jack could feel his own anger levels surging into a stifled rage. Hang in there, Garen, Jack whispered angrily through grit teeth. A few more seconds, 
it's all we need, then I swear to you, this ends for good. Pathetic creature, snarled Henrik at Garen's attempts to fight him off, a weakling like you can't stop me, and the cowards who run this village won't do anything either, they refuse to confront me because they need me, you all need me, the village wouldn't last a winter without me and everyone knows it. Like it or not, I own this place and everyone in it, that means you too, boy, don't you forget that, you're mine. Henrik grabbed Garen's hair and roughly pulled his head back, looking into his eyes. You think anyone is gonna care if you tell them about these little meetings of ours? They won't do a thing. I am the king of this place, I call the shots. I can do what the hell I like around here, and no one will dare stop me. Henrik leaned in further, putting his face even closer to Garen's. The terrified youth recoiled at the repugnant smell of bad breath and alcohol. You know it's only a matter of time before that Jack leaves here, and when he does, your mother's gonna be all mine again, this time for good. Henrik thought about what he just said, and grinned. That'll make me your daddy. He laughed out. But in the meanwhile, he reached up and roughly pinched Garen's cheek in his finger and thumb. You get to carry on being her substitute. Garen closed his eyes and tried to turn his head away, repelled by the man's sick words and actions. You'll remain mine to do with as I wish. You know, this remains our little secret. You don't ever tell a soul, or you know what'll happen, you know what I'll do to her. Henrik let go of the boy's hair and pushed him roughly to the floor. Garen lay there still clutching his stomach in pain and frozen in panic, barely able to move, his head shaking from side to side gesturing no as he watched the man walk over to the side of the barn where a large leather strap was coiled and hung on the wall. You know the routine by now, boy, he growled as he began to uncoil the strap and start to wrap one end of it around his own wrist. Garen curled up on the floor to protect himself as much as he could, clearly panicking and cowering in terror, anticipating another horrific beating. The man approached and stood over him. He started to slowly raise the strap above his head, intending to bring it down hard across the terrified boy's back. Hey! Garen? You in here? Suddenly a voice called from outside the barn. It was Jack. Henrik urgently spun around toward the voice. Jack called out again. As soon as Henrik recognized Jack's voice, he uncoiled the strap from his wrist and threw it behind a hay bale, then he quickly yanked Garen to his feet just moments before Jack appeared around the corner. Hey, Garen, there you are. Why didn't you call back? Come on supper's ready, time to go. Jack's voice gave no hint whatsoever that he knew exactly what had been happening. Henrik nodded silently to Garen, gesturing for him to go with O'Neill, and the youth hurried over to Jack's side, never more grateful for his presence than in that moment. Hey, Henrik, called Jack. You gonna join us at the hall? Hanan's got some new moonshine he wants us to try, says he's perfected the recipe. Reckons it's the best he's ever made. Henrik nodded. I'll be there soon, he grunted. Just need to finish up here. Great, chirped Jack, putting his arm around Garen's shoulders and ushering him safely out of the barn. Garen didn't speak as they walked, hurrying away into the darkness of the evening. Jack kept his arm firmly around Garen's still trembling shoulders as they quickly walked the dry track, guiding him, almost pushing him along to get them far enough away from the barn until he was satisfied Henrik could no longer see or hear them. Once they were out of sight and earshot, Jack stopped them both. My God, Garen, he gasped, wrapping his arms firmly around the traumatized youth and pulling him close. I am so so sorry, I couldn't help you sooner. How badly are you hurt? Garen was surprised by Jack's behavior, he had no idea the colonel had witnessed the entirety of his abuse taking place. He was clearly needing the reassuring embrace though, and eagerly returned it. I don't understand, what do you mean, Jack? I was helping Henrik pack the tools away, everything's fine, he replied in a forced chirpy voice. Garen, you don't need to hide it or pretend anymore. I saw everything. Garen's demeanor immediately changed and he started to panic, his breath suddenly panting. He pulled back from their embrace. No, you mustn't tell anyone, or he's gonna go after mother again, he gasped in complete panic. He said he'll kill her if I tell anyone, Jack. You have to promise you won't say anything. 
You can't. Jack gripped the panicking youth by the shoulders. Garen, Garen. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay, he reassured, trying to calm him down. Listen to me. It's over. It's all over. I promise, that's never going to happen, he reassured. Nothing is gonna happen to your mom. She's safe now and so are you. It took a while for Jack's words to sink in, but slowly the colonel could see the panic slowing in Garen's eyes, as the youth began glimpsing the possibility of a less dramatic and much more optimistic future. The adrenaline from his recent ordeal had started to drop off a little, and moments later, the youth's legs buckled under him as he was hit by a massive wave of immense, overwhelming relief. Jack only half managed to stop him collapsing all the way to the ground, stepping in and quickly grabbing him so they both ended up kneeling up on the dry dirt track. O'Neill could tell Garen was desperately trying to hold on to his composure, but it was all too much. He watched it disintegrating in his facial expression as a wave of unstoppable, powerful emotions rushed up and hit the boy like a freight train. Anticipating the imminent outburst, the colonel quickly pulled the youth into a tight hug as they knelt there and Garen began to wail uncontrollably into Jack's shoulder. Jack held him firmly, just being there for him, comforting him as the anguish of two years feeling completely alone, isolated and locked into this nightmare began to surface. The deep trauma in Garen's wailing was so genuine and raw, it tore at Jack's heart as he heard it. His hatred for Henrik was now total. He continued doing what he could to comfort the sobbing youth. It's okay, it's okay, Garen, he spoke, in a soft, reassuring voice, patting and stroking the traumatized boy's head and back, consoling him. It's all over, you're safe now, it's all over. That man's abusing, ends here, tonight, permanently, he whispered. I promise you, Garen, that was the last time that bastard will ever touch you or your mother again. Rescue of Innocence, Chapter 4 Later that evening, as on many evenings, a lot of the villagers had gathered socially in one of the slightly damaged buildings they temporarily used as the main village hall. Lyra usually attended such gatherings with Jack, but on this night, after the full unabridged horror story of Garen's ongoing abuse had been revealed to them both, she remained at the house to take care of him, and trusting Jack to carry out the final stage of his plan and put an end to the whole sorry saga. Everyone was enjoying the new recipe moonshine that Hainan had been making. Jack had been at the gathering for a short while, just waiting for the right moment to begin his endgame. So, Henrik, he shouted loudly enough for everyone in the building to hear. You've had quite a productive day. Everyone, including Henrik, raised a glass and cheered, assuming Jack was referring to the success of the day's planting. Well let's not be shy here. You've had a busy week, added Jack, still addressing the whole room. The room cheered again, now treating it as if Jack had just invented a new drinking game. In fact, you've had yourself a busy couple of years, haven't you? He continued, planting the crops. Planting the crops, cheered everyone, raising their glasses again. Organizing everyone on the fields, called Jack. Organizing, came another cheer in unison. Oh yeah, and we mustn't forget how. And guys, you're gonna love this one. How you've been beating the crap out of a young kid almost every day for the past two years. The room fell silent. What, Jack? What are you talking about? Came several overlapping voices of concern. Come on Henrik, don't be shy, we're all friends here. Continued Jack, still in his shouting ironic voice. Why don't you tell everyone how you started beating and abusing Garen on the very day his father died, and how you've been doing it ever since? The sound in the room was suddenly reduced to just the silence of a few muttering whispers. Jack was now looking very angry and confrontational. Come on, man, where's your tongue? And hey, don't be afraid to leave out all those juicy details too, you know, the ones like how you threatened you'd kill his mother unless he kept quiet or how you've been very careful to beat him in very specific places so the bruises on his body won't be seen. Henrik got up slowly and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jack. Lies. All lies, he growled. None of this is true. That boy has wanted me banished ever since there was that misunderstanding with his mother all those years ago, 
a misunderstanding I have been forgiven for. I'm sorry Jack, but you have been misled and tricked, that boy has been telling you a pack of lies. He's nothing but a delinquent and a troublemaker, he always has been. The silence remained in the room as everyone looked questioningly at each other as they heard Henrik's words. Oh seriously, cut the bull, yelled Jack in angry reply, fearlessly squaring up to the large burly man. I was in the barn earlier this evening, and I saw everything you did to him, you sick, son of a bitch. Jack's face was bright red and everyone could sense he was ready to start throwing fists in Henrik's direction. If I hadn't walked in when I did, you would have said about beating him with that strap you took off the wall, and God only knows what else. The silence continued to hang over the room as people recalled seeing the long leather strap that Henrik always kept coiled on the barn wall, but nobody knew what it was for. Your mind has been poisoned by that woman and her son to get me banished, she has never forgiven me, protested Henrik angrily, I tell you, this is a conspiracy of lies made up against me, and now you have sided with them. Oh really? Then explain the bruising, cuts and scars Garen has all over his body, snapped Jack. I cannot, but cuts and bruises don't prove anything, argued Henrik, he could have got them anywhere or even given them to himself to support his claims about me. No, you gave them all to him, you evil, lying son of a bitch, yelled Jack. In a complete rage he flew at Henrik, lunging forward and punching the huge man squarely on the jaw. Henrik immediately retaliated and began punching back, but the villagers quickly moved in to restrain them both, pulling them apart and preventing the punch-up from progressing any further. One of the villagers' elders stepped between the two restrained men, demanding they calm down. Jack and Henrik continued hatefully staring at each other and struggling against those restraining them for a few more moments before eventually they began to settle down to the point where the villagers felt confident enough to no longer restrain them. Henrik gave a deep sigh, recomposing himself, and then continued arguing his case. Jack remained angry, but promised he would refrain from any further outbursts. I'm telling you, these are lies made up about me, pleaded Henrik, I did not do what I am being accused of. Look, I know some of you don't like me very much and that I have made mistakes in the past, mistakes I have paid for dearly, but you all know I am a changed man, I am not the same man I once was and I am certainly not a liar. This is a conspiracy plotted against me from someone who has a motive to banish me from the village, because of mistakes I made a long time ago. You all know Jack has grown close to her, so I expect he will do anything to help her. He has simply become a part of her conspiracy against me. You don't rape someone by mistake, you arrogant bastard, snarled Jack, and her name is Lyra. Jack turned to address the villagers, I can tell you folks that this is most certainly not a changed man. There are people just like him where I come from too, most of them rarely change, they can't help themselves, they just get better at hiding their crimes. I'm sorry to say folks, Henrik is lying to you. Almost every word that has come out of that man's mouth this evening has been a lie. The village elder from earlier cautiously approached the colonel and began to argue a case. Jack, you already know you're welcome and respected here, but you are also from another world. In line with our customs and traditions, you are still classed as an outsider, he explained calmly, we have a very old and respected custom on Adora where the word of a villager will always be taken over that of an outsider. I'm sorry, but Henrik's words and arguments do have merit, and they automatically hold more validation. Immediately, Hainan stepped up and began to loudly counter-argue with the elder, supporting Jack's position. And does that include Henrik's claim that Garen is a delinquent and a troublemaker? Seriously? We all know Lyra's boy well, how many of us actually believe that's true, he argued. He looked at everyone around the room. No one replied. I thought so, he remarked. I don't know about all of you, but Jack's story seemed convincing to me, he argued, let's not delude ourselves, we all know what Henrik is like, and we know he's done exactly this same thing in the past. A lot of us have wanted him gone from this village for a long time. There was a general muttering between the others, nobody quite wanting to agree outright. Traditions and customs be damned, snapped Hainan, outsider or not, I would take Jack's word over Henrik's any day of the week, and so would all of you, and you know it. 
Some of the other villagers began to join in with the debate and in no time at all, it escalated until everyone was arguing loudly among themselves. Amidst all the noise and commotion, Jack quietly reached into his pocket and pulled out Daniel's camcorder that had been left behind in the chaos of the fire rain event. He held it above his head and calmly pressed the play button. One by one the others stopped arguing as they suddenly noticed the sound of the recording playing back on the device and saw the small TV screen showing Henrik standing in the barn with Garen. They all fell silent as a very clear recording of Henrik's voice rang out across the hall. Don't look at me like that, boy, I was doing your old man a favor, trying to toughen him up. Maybe if he was tougher he could have stopped me enjoying your mother that day. There were shocked gasps all around the hall, and everyone's eyes remained fixed on the camcorder screen as the whole scene played out. Some of the villagers winced or looked away, unable to bear watching as the video showed Garen being violently punched in the stomach by Henrik. Henrik's words and actions continued to play aloud for everyone to hear. A weakling like you can't stop me. And the cowards who run this village won't do anything either. They refuse to confront me because they need me. You all need me. The village wouldn't last a winter without me and everyone knows it. Like it or not, I own this place and everyone in it, that means you too, boy, don't you forget that, you're mine. Everyone in the room saw the entire recording and witnessed Henrik unleashing his twisted, sadistic behavior on Garen, right up until Jack entered the barn and rescued him. They all heard Henrik's warnings to Garen about telling anyone of his abuse and also his threat to kill Lyra. Jack had fulfilled his promise to Lyra, providing the irrefutable evidence needed to end Henrik's long reign of abuse. The rest was now up to the villagers. Rescue of Innocence Chapter 5 Jack quietly closed the door to the community hall and headed out into the darkness, back along the track toward home. From the other side of the door came muffled, angry, animated and arguing voices that slowly faded as the building fell away into the darkness behind him. Opening the front door, Jack stepped into the dimly lit house. Lyra was huddled with Garen on the bench seat beside the roaring fireplace. Both had been waiting anxiously for him to return. As he quietly closed the door, they both hurried over to him, desperate to hear what had happened. Jack immediately reached his arms around them both, hugging them lovingly, gently pressing his forehead against both theirs simultaneously in a moment of great tenderness. It's over. He spoke softly. Henrik is banished, permanently. They're not even waiting till morning, they're escorting him out of the valley right now. He's on his own from there, assuming he gets there in one piece. There are some very angry people out there right now. Garen became overwhelmed by an immense sense of relief as he heard Jack's words the words he had been desperately praying to hear for two years. The colonel cupped his hand gently onto the back of the youth's head. You'll never see that monster again, I promise, he reassured in a whisper, it really, truly, is all over. He felt Garen's arms tighten around him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, he gasped in a sobbed whisper over and over, massively grateful at finally being liberated from his living nightmare. Two years you endured that monster in silence, keeping him away from your mother, protecting her, Jack whispered. It's the darn bravest thing I've ever seen. Thanks for reading my story. A review would seriously make my day.